Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Freight Mobility Research Institute and FAU IT student chapter, I would like to thank you all for accepting our webinar invitation and joining us today in this webinar series. My name is Anika Tabassum. I'm the president of FAU IT student chapter, and I'll be the moderator of today's, today's event, along with our vice president, Alini Machado. If you have any questions regarding the presentation, you can tap it in the chat box or speak up at the end of the presentation. Alini would be taking your questions at the end. Today, we are really happy to have Dr. In Hai Wong from the University of Washington with us. He will be presenting today on the topic, making transportation infrastructure smarter using Internet of Things and artificial intelligent technologies. He's a professor at civil and environmental engineering and adjunct professor at electrical and computer engineering of the University of Washington. He is also the founding director of the UW Smart Transportation Applications and Research Laboratory and also served as director for Pacific Northwest Transportation Consortium. Thank you for your time, Dr. Wang, and we are excited to hear your presentation. Now the floor is yours. Thank you, Anika, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to present our work at the University of Washington to the audience of the Freight Mobility Research Institute. Uh, now let me share my screen. Um, so let's start from here. I assume everybody see my screen now. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so uh, I'm here presenting actually the research work done uh, by my team. So uh, I have several PhD students closely in, engaged into this project. So they are Raymond Ke, Ziyuan Pu, and Chen Xi Liu. Uh, Ziyuan in particular is now a professor at Monash University, already graduated from my lab. So we are facing a lot of challenges um, in today's world. So you see traffic jam. So every big city uh, have a lot of traffic congestions happening every day. Um, we're also facing the shortage of parking. Um, in particularly downtown areas, if you cannot find uh, a good parking spot, you will be uh, driving around local parking. And this is a further uh, worsen the congestion. We don't have enough infrastructure funding to keep our infrastructure in a great shape. So you see this is actually the, the picture uh, from the um, I-35 West. Um, it, this bridge was broken uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, that shows actually the lack of funding could result in very serious problem. And unfortunately, we still have a lot of bridge in a kind of a dangerous situation. Traffic safety is another big issue. Um, so we're certainly facing challenges about um, traffic safety. Um, if you look at the number of crashes, so we're still very high and uh, over 30,000 people killed on the road every day, uh, every year, sorry. Um, and we also have a significant amount of pedestrians killed. And this number has been increasing uh, after uh, going down to the bottom and then keep um, increasing over the past several years. So ASC has an infrastructure report card and they do this infrastructure assessment. And here shows the 2017 infrastructure uh, report card result. Uh, in particular, the roadway got a rating of D. Um, so this is actually showing a grade that's not favorable. And the reason is actually uh, the U.S. has been underfunding its highway system for years and resulting in uh, $836 billion backup of highway and the bridge capitalists. What does this mean? So this means we need money to try to keep our infrastructure system in a great shape. So if you look at, are we actually 
merging the gap by investing more money to our current roadway system. Um, this is probably not a good result. You see this chart uh, since 1947 uh, all the way to 2016. In general, you know the trend of the federal grants for transportation of transportation infrastructure as a share of U.S. GDP has been declining or stay at the same level. And then, as transportation professionals, we need a solution to uh, keep our infrastructure in a safe uh, and efficient way to support our economy and people's travel needs. Today's transportation infrastructure, if you look at, for example, intersection um, or freeway, they are pretty much enclosed the system. They take very limited input from the users. Um, at the intersection, for example, uh, all you got is some traffic sensors collecting vehicles arrival information, and they know there is some vehicle waiting for service from that particular direction. Uh, we normally do not know how many vehicles are waiting there, where are they heading to. And the signal system is also kind of a monologue system. I tell you when to go, when to stop. Um, even in some intersections, there may be no person in a particular direction. Uh, the signal may still allocate right away. So this is kind of wasting the resource. Um, the freeway system have a lot of signs there, and the system is designed in a way normally equal capacity. Let's say we have maybe four lanes going to downtown and another four lane go into downtown. So we all understand in the morning time, more people want to go to downtown. And in the afternoon, more people want to exit downtown. So the demand is not balanced. But unfortunately, you see the design is pretty much equal capacity design. Um, so that means during the peak travel time, one direction is overloaded, while another direction is likely not sufficiently used. If we could figure out a way to make the infrastructure better utilized, I think that's certainly a great contribution. And I believe the new technology could help us to accomplish that goal. So I consider the future infrastructure system will be smart and also safe. So let's say, the current system is a kind of enclosed system, have very limited interaction with the users. Uh, and the new system will have users like vehicle users or active users like pedestrian bicyclists and the weather information, all kind of variables affecting traffic operations uh, together with you know, the service the highway would provide. So highway certainly not just a system waiting for people to use. It is actually a system supporting uh, the society's um, travel needs and economic needs. So I consider the future system will be connected. Um, so this is based on the connected vehicle system. Uh, users will be connected to the infrastructure system way to interact with the infrastructure system. So we want to know how the road condition look like. Is there any black ice on the road surface? And at the same time, the infrastructure system will collect user input so they can understand better than just collecting data from the limited point detectors. Um, so because of this kind of interaction, um, the system is more likely to be more responsive to the user's needs and requests. And uh, in a lot of scenarios, we can pre-tell you know, in different parts of the system uh, what is happening, and therefore the system could use its uh, control mechanism to be proactive in preventing further congestions or like uh, avoiding uh, vehicles getting into a kind of risky situation. Because the users understand the system, the system understand the user better, I think the user could be configuring its capacity allocation and try to be more flexible in addressing the travel needs 
uh, and therefore the system will be more efficient and safe. So all these things will be based on data and the data will be supporting the intelligence that make the infrastructure system smarter. So we have a lot of uh, roadway systems designed, you know, due to whatever reason, um, could be dangerous during a particular situation. Um, this picture shows actually a portion of the road, of the Atlantic Road in Norway. It is a very beautiful location and people enjoy driving, but you can also imagine with such a, a slope and the curvature, during the winter time, if this is still open, it could be very dangerous. Uh, another example is this uh, California Highway uh, 62. Eight people killed uh, in 2013 and 3.3 fatal crashes for every 100 million miles driven. And this roadway is actually uh, more dangerous, three times as dangerous as other roads in California. So how do we address the challenge? Connected vehicle technologies can help. And according, according to the US DOT's website, uh, connected vehicle technology can potentially reduce up to 80% of the crashes. Okay, so we have a great tool, and certainly we want to use this tool to really benefit our society. Let's see how this may work. So connected vehicle is not a new concept. It's been there for decades. So basically the idea is uh, we gather the information and pass the information to the right place. Like if you are, you are a user looking for a parking spot, you know where has a parking and like a spot available. Uh, at the same time, if there is a um, crash somewhere, you want to inform users there's a crash here with the reduced capacity of the road, and you can choose where to go. So certainly the mechanism is terrific and USDOT and the local transportation agencies also made their investment. So here shows the connected vehicle devices are increasingly deployed. Um, and you see actually we have plenty um, of devices deployed to at least demonstrate the capability of such a system. But unfortunately, we don't really see a lot of reportings about where this connected vehicle technology has been applied and what kind of accomplishments we made. So looking the details into this, I would consider the current system um, for supporting the connected vehicle applications may be too complicated. So let's see how this works. Um, so you need to have an onboard unit uh, in your vehicle in order to use this uh, application. Uh, I know people prefer using cell phones, but unfortunately, the cell phone does not support DSRC. And uh, quite a lot of the roadside units not supporting you know, the communication direct like before. So let's say the request sent to the roadside unit. And the roadside unit just in about the communications between the infrastructure and the other users. But roadside unit does not produce information. So let's say if roadside unit want to pass some valuable information to the users, it has to communicate with, for example, the traffic control center, uh, the control cabinet. And these places actually gather the information from, for example, traffic sensors on the road. Um, and these sensors provide the data to the traffic controller. And the traffic controller do the signal control. And actually, most of these existing sensors uh, for the purpose of for traffic control or data collection, not for supporting connected vehicles. Um, consequently, you know, if you have no good information to be shared with the roadside unit, and the roadside unit may not be also supported, for example, by all these sensors, it's going to be very hard for this connected vehicle applications to see um, the benefit of popular. We often see redundant sensor deployment on our current infrastructure system. So this is just an example. You see like a, a lot of different sensors installed. Um, but um, each sensor actually 
located in different places and for a different purpose. Let's say each sensor gathered the information and then transfer to the control center. That's actually a different data stream, um, like a loop, infrared sensor, and video sensor. But getting to the traffic control center, these information are separated. If you want to combine the information, try to support an important application, you have to gather data and then integrate the data. But unfortunately, most of the traffic control uh, professionals, they are not trained as a computer scientist who knows how to pull the data from different database systems and integrate them together. So this is a clearly a challenge that also affect the usage of the connected vehicles because consulting dating sensor data is already complicated. Uh, if you want to gather useful information that the users would need when they are driving on the road, it's very difficult. So if we want to address this challenge, we need to be coming up with a more effective solution. And this is actually the solution we came up as the laboratory studying for uh, transportation and intelligence. So here, we introduced the sensor, we call it a uh, mobile unit for sensing traffic. And this is basically, basically an integrated sensor and a communication device. Um, it enables communication with the onboard unit and also cell phone. It also communicate with the TMC, but it doesn't have to. Uh, because it has the sensing capability and the communication capability, it could directly work as a major component on the infrastructure side to talk to um, the users directly. So currently we have been working uh, on the sensor for uh, multiple different applications. So we want to make this particular sensor uh, innovative IoT technology for comprehensive traffic sensing and V2X communications. Uh, we have already integrated these technologies. For example, uh, uh, media access control address sensing. So this has been a popular approach for gathering data so to support like a travel time uh, measurement. Uh, we also integrated you know, computer vision approach um, edge computing, because this is an edge device with very limited computing power. Uh, we also applied artificial intelligence, try to take advantage of the accomplishments made in this AI world and apply them to transportation system. Um, we gather different information and try to integrate them together in this particular device. So this would avoid you know, the trouble pulling data from different systems you have to deal with different database system, different format, even different resolution of the data. I think this is actually quite a troublesome thing to do, but with this device, you basically don't have those trouble. Everything is measured at one location and uh, the system already integrated the information you need to use. So at this point, we have already made our uh, master sensor capable of collecting uh, travel time data through the uh, media access control address matching. Uh, it collects temperature, humidity. Um, it can also calculate you know, the visibility of the roadway. Um, it, it has the V2X communication function, um, detect road surface condition. For example, uh, is the road surface covered by snow, uh, covered by ice or dry or wet? Um, we also have the capability of vehicle count and the classification. So this is not just constrained to vehicle, it also could collect pedestrian information. So with this device in hands, so we make you know, the data collection, uh, data analysis and decision-making easy because all the data is already integrated and fused in the sensor and we can provide the information needed by the traffic operator and they can make an easy decision, or the system can even recommend a decision for the operator to consider. Um, and then the information could be communicated to like uh, the user on the road, 
the traffic control devices or any you know information channel that would care about sending um, the, the traffic information or some other in road on the roadway device you want to control we can also use the sensor to be controlling those devices so this chart actually shows the example installation of our iot technology so after introducing the general background and uh, the feature of our new technology i want to show you two examples so the first one i want to show is the application to highway monitoring this is actually a real world project that we are we are working on so this is actually funded by the norwegian public road administration uh, so the, the reason they want to have such a technology is because um, this e8 corridor uh, connecting the fisheries inside the arctic circle uh, to helsinki airport is a very important freight corridor because a lot of truck will be carrying the fresh fish and go through this corridor, cross the border of Finland, and uh, get the fish loaded uh, at the Helsinki airport. So the airplane can fly over Russia and deliver the fresh fish to the Asian market. So this corridor is very important for Norway's in, uh, economy. And the Norwegian Public Road Administration want, want to make sure this roadway is um, smooth and uh, supporting the, the big truck travel, even during the winter, uh, very cold uh, weather conditions. Uh, so this is actually a picture taken um, uh, on this corridor. See, this corridor was kind of old, so the design was not quite to the European standard. So during the winter time, because of the geometric factors, a slope in a curve, uh, and the heavy snow, uh, freight vehicle often see challenges. Um, but this is in a quite a rural area. It's not realistic to have, you know, um, instant response truck to go over this area very often. So Norwegian Public Road Administration want to know if there is any incidents on the corridor, and they want to assign the instant response truck to be there. But how do we find that? So we actually suggested putting up nine mass sensors. So this will shape the road into eight different segments. And we can look at the travel time and look at the road surface condition to see if the travel time is normal. If it's abnormal, there's a good chance that there may be an incident occurred and we can send a warning message. So this is actually why this project is initiated. So to serve that purpose, uh, we need to detect you know, if there's an incidence uh, in any of the segments being monitored. And if yes, we need to send the warning message to the traffic operators. Uh, we also need to look at, you know, the travel time reliability under different road surface conditions. And therefore, we need to know what's the road surface condition. Um, and we want to also detect vehicle and classify them so we know uh, how many trucks are passing by what's the truck's average speed and what's the uh, smaller car's speed. Um, so all these things are heavily related to actually the temperature and the humidity condition. You know, in Norway, the weather could go to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the cold winter. So we have to make our sensors survive in this kind of climate, uh, inclement weather conditions. So this is actually an overall approach for us to uh, do this, you know, detection. So basically, uh, we have, um, you know, the optical flow trajectories to trigger which part is actually the road surface. And then we can detect uh, what's the road surface condition uh, based on uh, the video images and also the temperature humidity uh, data we collect from, from there. Uh, and then we detect vehicle, track vehicle, uh, so this is actually the, the, the video part. For the MAC address matching, I think that's kind of a common. It's been there for uh, multiple years, so I will just ignore that part. So this actually shows how we use optical uh, flow, try to identify the road surface area. So in this way, we don't need to be you know, uh, detecting the entire image. 
So you see this is a, a regular uh, uh, video image for a roadway system. And this is after we detect several vehicles. You see gradually the road surface is covered. And this is after we complete the approach to so see road surface has been identified. And this is another example uh, for us to do the same thing. So the sensors have not been installed in Norway yet. So we ship the sensors to Norway and they are evaluating that. And uh, if everything is smooth, they will put that up and then we can officially collect data from Norway. But before we get there, we have to train our model. So we collect data from the WashDOT uh, surveillance video cameras. You see actually, this is actually the dry payment condition, uh, wet condition, snow and the snow. I, partial snow and possibly icy condition. So we gather um, tens of thousands of video images and our students label them and we train our model, try to detect real surface situation. Um, so here is actually the detection result uh, using the data we have uh, collected in Washington. So you see the dry, dry payment condition also detected it's dry. This is I think 97.5%. Uh, and the snowy and the snowy detection uh, is in 97.9%. Uh, partial snow is a little bit more challenging. So we got 90% detection accuracy. Uh, rainy situation versus dry pavement situation, I think this is uh, a little bit difficult because the rain may be at different levels and uh, the pavement look dark, with the rain still look dark. And some clean pavement surface look dark even without water. So this is the part we're still working on and try to make an improvement. So we tried different methodologies. Uh, for example, we used the random forest classifier. Um, and this has been after we try all these other methods. So this is actually the final approach we use for classifying the road surface conditions. For traffic volume detection and the vehicle classification, uh, we actually run uh, a background sub subtraction approach first. Maybe you wonder why you do this. As actually the edge device that we have have very limited computing power. If we run a AI approach uh, for detecting vehicles, so it will take a couple of seconds and then uh, you cannot count vehicles um, and also detect the uh, um, the, the type of vehicle uh, accurately. So some actually some system I see, um, they use actually a LiDAR system to try to trigger. If there is a vehicle coming, uh, trigger the AI approach and then do the detection. So we choose to use the background subtraction uh, somehow serve as a trigger. So we see actually vehicle get into the field and we identify the moving blocks. And then we apply a deep neural network classifier, try to go deep into it and see uh, what kind of vehicle it is. It could be just not a vehicle. It's just a, a, a false alarm from the background sub subtraction method. So the data we train in Washington, it, it doesn't mean it's, it's going to work in no way. So, but still uh, here is actually the, the vehicle detection results. So we're pretty happy uh, with the, the current detection accuracy. As you can see, so the, the car accuracy is 91%, uh, truck 87 and bus 96%, uh, bicycle is 95%. So background is background is 100% accurate. Um, in order to make our model ready for transfer to Norway, we also conducted the transfer learning uh, and the transfer learning data, we use the MIO TCD data. Uh, and actually our approach is using the uh, mobile net backbone. So for doing this, this is actually some example uh, pictures from the MIO TCD data set. So this is the application for you know, using uh, our IoT technology for highway monitoring um, and also uh, warning message sending to uh, traffic operators when needed. Uh, I want to show you another example, which is applied in the kind of urban area. So this is an application to smart parking surveillance. Um, so this is actually a project we completed in 2018. Uh, and this project was funded by Sound Transit. Um, so the 
The project location is the Angle Lake parking garage. This is a, a giant parking garage with multiple thousand parking spots. Uh, we chose actually six parking spots uh, on the third floor. So here is the third floor location. Um, this location actually is marked the HOV parking. Uh, if there's no vehicle come to occupy uh, before like eight o'clock and expires to like just a regular parking. Let's say you are a single occupant vehicle, you come after eight, uh, if there's an open spot you can use. So uh, some transit is curious to know how full these slots are, you know, before the, the regulation expires. So we put our sensor here and also our sensor on the top floor. So the reason to put on the top floor is to try to test the sensors um, uh, working condition under, you know, rainy situation, uh, uh, sun glaring and all challenging uh, situations. So we have one sensor monitoring the third floor parking slots or six slots and another sensor monitoring 10 slots on the top floor. So this is actually uh, our detection um, flow chart. So we have basically two detectors running at the edge side. So one is the background based, another is the SSD. SSD stands for a single shot multi-box detector. Um, and we also transfer the ground truth image to our server. So you see this is the edge side and we use the cell phone network, you know, the cell data transfer our, our result and the, the images to um, our server. So our server will be doing the tracking of the vehicles. Let's say this vehicle detected in this spot. Is this the same vehicle we saw earlier? So it does the tracking and then finally conclude how long the vehicle has been there. So for the vehicle detection side, um, because of the limited computing power on our edge device, so we have to be very careful on modifying the existing approach, try to make it work efficiently. So we, we use this SSD method with the mobile net as the backbone. Um, we also did the transfer learning using the same data set I mentioned for the Norway project. Um, we run both the SSD and the uh, background subtraction approach at the same time, try to ensure the detection accuracy. And here shows actually some of the training process uh, of the, the model. So this model actually was originally trained by the PASCO VOC. So this actual data set you can download. Um, and here are some examples of the, the vehicles uh, of the data. Um, and we also combined in the PASCO VOC and the MIO TC, TCD data uh, to do you know, the, the training and also uh, the transfer learning. So the edge detection, we just use simple background subtraction. So you see this, this is actually a, a blob of the images different from the background. So this is actually corresponding to the vehicle uh, marked in this uh, box. Um, and then there's another vehicle moving. So these two are highlighted and then we just process this. Consider this actually there are two blobs um, needs to be analyzed and we send the information to the server. And on the server side, we need to analyze all the results detected by the background approach and also the SSD approach. In addition, um, we receive the, the image every five minutes, try to validate the results manually. So we have, you know, the results coming to the server and the server will need to be doing an in-depth analysis to see if this new vehicle is the same vehicle we, we, we detected earlier. If yes, you see calculating the, the parking time should continue. Otherwise, you need to start the timer and the recalculate. So here shows the detection accuracy uh, for our parking detection. You see it, we separate this into sunny condition, rainy, cloudy, foggy, uh, and the daytime, nighttime. So in general, I think the detection accuracy is satisfactory. Um, so we feel 
the approach in general has been working well. Uh, so the, the particularly you see the 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 sixth floor, which is the top floor is like uh, the outside um, open space. So we got um, ninety seven percent, ninety four percent in the weekday or the, the weekend time. So we have also an online information system. Um, the system shows actually the ground truth uh, video image and also the parking slot condition. Uh, and these dots are indicating if they're all occupied, we show in red. If they are not occupied, it's, it's white. So even in, for example, the rainy condition, uh, there's a big rain jobs on the camera lens, uh, we still get pretty decent detection results uh, to the experiment period. Um, in the third floor, actually, it looks like uh, maybe it's easier, but actually it's not, because the structure is also open structure. When the sun shines strong, there are quite a lot of challenges with you know, vehicles, projections, sh shadow, etc. So how does our methodology compare to other uh, similar uh, methodologies? So we also do the comparison. You see the last column is our research result. So basically, if you look at uh, the system accuracy, we got 95.6% accuracy. And uh, the system efficiency, we got one three percent So all these numbers look pretty good uh, on our side. So we, we are confident that this particular methodology is going to be useful for making, um, let's say, the parking infrastructure smarter. So I talked about the general needs for um, information technology to collect data, process data, and share the information with the users. And uh, we detected, uh, we de developed this technology called uh, mobile unit for sensing traffic. Um, this is actually an example installation image. So we consider this is very flexible you know, in applications. Uh, if you do not have a lot of money, you just find a roadway segment is very dangerous. You want to apply a technology, try to detect the danger and share with the users about this problem. You could just uh, hook the sensor up and the sensor will be communicating using the cell phone data. So if there's a cell phone uh, signal there uh, and data available, so the sensor could work. Uh, it just needs a power supply and it detects everything through the analysis and then send the information automatically. Uh, it works in a very broad in the temperature range. It works you know, from negative 40 to 158. Um, it could also broadcast information to users directly, send to the traffic control center, or send to any social media account. So I think uh, it has the potential to be very timely communication about what's going on on the road. So we do think uh, the technology we developed using the IoT and the AI technology uh, represented by this particular you know, mobile unit for sensing traffic could benefit you know, agencies um, at all levels. So you have a smaller road, bigger road. I think the sensor could all come to play a role communicating with you know, um, the users and also transportation professionals. So this project is funded by um, the PAC Trans Center, uh, Pacific Northwest Transportation Consortium. Uh, it also received funding recently from the University of Washington's Co Co Commotion Innovation Gap Funds. So UW wants to help the sensor to be, uh, you know, uh, becoming a standard product. So we do believe this sensor technology uh, could help um, target zero, like try to reduce the roadway crashes. It can also help to make the infrastructure smarter, even without the bulky supporting components needed by the connected vehicle ready. So this can still be there and play a role to get the uh, communication started. So with that, I just want to appreciate your time.
in your attention. So I will stop here um, and waiting to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for sharing the research advancements of your research group at the University of Washington. And smart and proactive infrastructure management is an important issue. And it's great to see the applications of IoT, sensors, computer vision, and artificial intelligence. So like Dr. Wang say, I will now be taking the questions from the audience. So you may either type in the chat or speak up. I don't see any questions. Sorry, I, I was muted. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, I think I will take the first. So um, I have a question because uh, you present like uh, this system can apply in highway system and apply to the uh, parking. So because we know a lot of new mobilities appears and some new infrastructures needed to be established. So is there any other application of this uh, system to be used? Like application scenario? Oh, so um, I think the uh, Internet of Things, just the sensor network. I think if you get more traffic data and use the traffic data to make the right decision, we need more traffic data. So the current uh, highway system roadway network with the limited point detectors is not enough. So I would say um, any sensing technology uh, is useful in transportation um, practice. Um, we developed this sensor is actually, this is a long way actually, it's been, we've been working on this technology for probably 10 years. Started for doing just the MAC address sensing, you know, that's for travel time data connection. Uh, using this to uh, um, replace the license plate recognition technology. So in that sense, um, the travel time data collection will be cheaper. And then we consider how we can add other functions. Let's say when we work on this Norway project, so we, we recognize the needs for detecting road surface condition and combine information all together. So I would say for safety, and for um, just uh, mobility applications data, um, such a technology could be useful. And you can easily change the software in this hardware system and try to make it use for your specific purpose. Like you want to collect some pedestrian data, you just implement a system to uh, detect uh, pedestrians, the bicyclists. So I, I would say this is kind of universal, maybe used for a lot of different uh, scenarios. Thank you for your question, Dan, and thank you for answering, answering Dr. Wang. Um, I have a question here in the chat. What messages being broadcasted to vehicles and pedestrians in any standard message formats? When using the current cell communication, what is the general latency? Um, this is a good question. So actually, there is the SE standard we need to follow. So at this moment, uh, you may all know that uh, FCC will need to make a decision on what to do with DSRC. So because they, they will be meet tomorrow, uh, I don't know the result, but uh, there's a possibility um, that DSRC may become history. Um, so very likely in the future, we'll be need to use the uh, cellular um, V2X technology. And that's pretty much using uh, 4G, LTE, 5G for communications. Uh, what we have been doing in this particular technology development, setting a local network. Let's say you broadcast information at a signalized intersection to pedestrians. When pedestrians walk into this zone, you enable the communication from your phone to the device, and then you could request signal timing, uh, and we can send the timing information to you, or you can re request a particular face call. So this is also a research project ongoing with the uh, Washington State Department of Transportation. Uh, so 
you ask for what kind of message can be sent. So basically, whatever message uh, you feel the, the users would need, and uh, maybe the operators consider necessary for people to know. If this is installed at a roadway segment, you detect there's snow, like in Seattle area. Normally, we don't have snow during the winter, but once we got snow, it's a disaster because a lot of um, very deep, uh, um, like a grades, like uh, um, those roadways become very slippery and people normally do not have the kind of tire to drive on the snow. And uh, typically there are a lot of crashes during the snowy days. So the city um, transportation professionals uh, communicated with us and they have the interest to see how such sensor may detect the situation and uh, let the traffic operators know and let the users know this segment is slippery, there is no coverage. So I think it could be also used in that scenario. If you are walking there, you also want to avoid, you know, that like a slope, a big slope uh, covered by snow because it could be very dangerous. So the latency, I think uh, so far the latency is pretty uh, minor. Uh, we maybe with the number of increase of uh, users that may change, we have not conduct enough tests to give you a, a good summary of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any. Um, uh, yeah. Or, yes. Hey, hello. Uh, so can I ask a question to Proof Wong? Yes, sure. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, actually, uh, before, uh, uh, I noticed you have some like the computer vision application on the street. And uh, you mentioned that you use the SSD and uh, mobile night uh, to detect the vehicles on the street. Uh, I don't know if that's a typo or not. Uh, in your table, you mentioned it's just uh, one frame per second. But uh, as I know, for the SSD plus the mobile night, it will be pretty fast. Uh, for the accuracy, I, I'm not sure it's uh, it's a dependent on training, but the, I think the speed it will be very fast. You are right. The speed it should be very fast if you are computing this on a regular server computer. Think about you are computing on an edge device, and the edge device is a very limited computing power. Oh yes, this is the edge AI, not the regular AI. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the edge AI, you basically need to consider, you see, like I have a very small space and you need to keep everything inside and keep the major function um, operating and respond very quickly uh, and leave some work that could be done by the server. Let it do like, uh, let the server does it. Just like uh, the, the parking detection example, we do some initial process, like uh, processing of the image and then leave the tracking and the re-identifying that particular vehicle. It's not cross-camera re it's the same camera re-ID in the server because that will need more computing power. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, so the, all the comparison is Azure AI. It's not, not the, the regular AI, cloud AI. So for the cloud, you also need to use the GPU, right? For the- uh, Yeah, so you certainly- yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, for the IJI. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't heard about the IJI. So could you like to explain a little bit like so the difference between the IJI and the regular AI? Okay, so um, let me use this example. Um, let's say if you want to deploy uh, the master sensor on the rural road uh, and monitor the road surface condition, a uh, typical approach will be you carry all the video images back to the server, and then the server will produce, like, uh, process the video and decide if the road is covered by snow or ice. Yeah, and this is the regular approach, but this would require very high bandwidth communication, and typically, um, the rural place may not have such high bandwidth communication, or the communication cost could be very high. Um, if you leave the edge side to detect if there is a vehicle coming, let's say if you take a picture, let's say every 10 minutes, and then send a single picture to 
like the server to process it. And then if you see a vehicle arrives, you know there may be a vehicle. It triggers this. So this is the edge side. Uh, you still need to recognize, you know, is there a vehicle or this is just the, the regular roadway background. If there's a vehicle, you want to send that particular image to the server and the server do the processing. So you can consider like uh, Edge AI will be using a small device. It could be an uh, older phone. It could be a Raspberry Pi, those kind of uh, small uh, computing device and try to conduct the work on site and then integrate the power of the server AI, try to accomplish the best result. We're also using this technology for the curb space management with the city of Bellevue. And we use this um, edge side to detect if the vehicle, there's any change of the vehicle. Uh, if it is, we send the image to the server and the server is going to compare to see, is this the same vehicle? The vehicle you know, uh, already left and there's a new vehicle arrived. Does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So, I'm wondering yes. if this is uh, expensive to deploy the sensor. Is that expensive? Oh, so I think uh, it's not expensive. I would say if you consider you have to deploy multiple sensors, let's say, for the roadway, you need to have, for example, loop detector, right? Uh, loop detector installed, and then you also want to have surveillance video cameras. You want to see what's going on because loop detector may be manu uh, malfunctioning and send you the wrong data. Um, you also want to see what is this roadway area's temperature, you know, uh, humidity condition. If you install all these sensors, every sensor will cost you multi thousand dollars, right? And then if you combine them all together and you have to deal with the headache, you know, merging the data together, integrate the data. This is actually multiple times of the cost you need to spend compared to just to get, you know, a must sensor hook it up. So I think it's a more economic solution, try to um, collect data and uh, conduct the connected vehicle applications. Mm 